think we should start our first academic session. We have three papers in this session. So the plan is this. Uh, we will have 15 minute presentation for each of these three papers. Then there will be about 15 minute general discussion by Margarita. And uh, at the end of the session, there will be there will be a few minutes for Q and A. Uh, I will ask all presenters to be on time. I will give them a two minute uh, mark in their chat, and uh, I will try to be flexible. Maybe one minute, but we have to uh, finish on time. There will be time at the end of the session to respond to questions from uh, the audience. The audience can ask question in the Q and A box. So. I think we can start with the first paper. The first paper will be presented by Mark Painter from St. Louis University, and the title is Consequences of Working from Home, Evidence from Cell Site Analysts. All right, thank you so much, and thanks for having us. This is great. So uh, this is really early work. So this is a, a proposal, as um, we were mentioning, a lot of these papers aren't fully developed yet, and you'll see why we, we haven't fully developed yet as I go through this presentation. Um, this is co-authored with Russell James from University of Kentucky. Uh, and our goal with this paper is to study how work from home in the, the cell side analyst industry setting uh, changes both research quality, and analyst retention, and financial market outcomes. So one of the biggest shifts we, we think will happen long-term from COVID is this propensity to work from home. So this graph is from BLS about how people work from home pre-COVID, and you can see it was really rare. The majority of people in this survey never work from home, both all workers and in the, the financial sector. Um, and it was really rare to be um, working from home even one to two days, and even rarer to be working from home completely full time. Um, and as we've gone through the pandemic, as you're all likely aware, this shift has, has drastically changed. Um, so thinking, you know, BC, that's you know, before COVID, not before Christ, that's around 2.1% of people were working from home full time. Uh, a survey by Barrero, Bloom, and Davis found that this shot up quite a bit. They've been periodically surveying people throughout the, the pandemic. They found in May about 42% of people were working from home. Now, of course, this is you know, likely pandemic driven, but there's going to be you know, changes in how we do this going forward. So, as far as, are, as recently as January of this year, there was still about 35% of people working from home. Um, now, going forward, this will likely settle down to a, a lower number. About 80% of those survey responders said they want to work from home at least partially going forward. And this is going to be pretty big in the financial sector, we think, as well. Uh, so, Dingle and Neiman have estimates of different industries. They found about 88% of jobs in the financial industry can be done at home. So, this is a, a sector that's really going to be affected by uh, this new work lifestyle. That raises the question, is this gonna be good or bad for these firms? Um, it's kind of mixed evidence so far. So, so on the plus side, it seems like um, uh, evidence has shown that employees really like this flexibility from survey evidence. So the employees uh, enjoy being able to work from home. Um, and there's some evidence that when call center workers went uh, shifted to work from home during the pandemic, they actually had increases in their productivity. So it seemed like work from home does have some pretty decent benefits going for it. Um, there's also some downsides. So it's there's also evidence that um, it can attract less productive workers uh, that want to work from home. So there's a selection effect there. Um, and when you're thinking about more cognitively demanding tasks, uh, so Kuhn and all looked at the switch from in-person to online chess tournaments, they found it these intellectually demanding tasks that performance actually declines. Uh, there's also less networking and mentoring for junior employees um, and a lot of those effects that uh, Renee was touching on as well that can be negative things happening for uh, the switch to work from home. So kind of got these, these competing forces. So we want to take it to this financial sector to see um, exactly what the, the consequences have been. The thing about the sell side analyst industry this is going to be a lot of highly educated employees that are doing a repeated task, but it's a, a cognitively demanding task. So it's really changing each period. Um, and we think, and we have some early evidence showing that there's, there's likely a lot of variation in how these um, analysts respond to this work from home. Uh, so there's anecdotes out there like JP Morgan is very 
a big proponent of working at the office. They wanted their senior traders in the office as early as September of 2020. Uh, whereas Deutsche Bank is uh, in November of 2020 was still weighing a, a permanent shift of two days a week remote working. Uh, so there's these different work cultures. Uh, we're also going to see variation across geographies. Um, analysts aren't all on Wall Street. They're, there's still some in Chicago, San Francisco, um, Minneapolis. So we're gonna have different exposures to lockdowns. We're gonna have different exposures to the health risks of COVID uh, that will also create some variation. So we'll have variation in this work from home measure, uh, but we'll have analysts still essentially doing the same tasks. You know, Even if you're working from home or from the office, you still need to forecast Walmart's earnings for this quarter. So we have this outcome that um, they're all targeting, but we'll have variation in work from home. We'll also just have more of a, a general push going forward between you know, the bosses of these firms and what the employees want as this last um, anecdote was talking about. So a lot of sources of variation here. So we wanna see if this affects those, those research forecasts of these analysts. And of course, these analysts are really important information, information intermediaries in financial markets. So any change in their research quality is likely gonna have financial market outcomes as far as uh, the information environment of firms. So we wanna see at the firm level, if there's any consequences as well. So this raises the question, how are we actually going to measure this? So some research we'll see today, other prior research I've cited has successfully used surveys, uh, just using the COVID lockdowns or school lockdowns as proxies, or perhaps partnering with one specific firm to get their proprietary productivity measures. We're gonna take a slightly different approach. We're going to try to get measures for multiple firms that's still observable. Uh, and the way we're gonna do this is using uh, individually linked GPS data to smartphones. Uh, so we can track um, how many analysts are going to the office by matching this data to the addresses of about a thousand brokerage branches that we've collected. So the data we're using comes from a, a data as a service vendor called Veriset. So these companies became pretty popular during the pandemic and, and a lot of that COVID research that Renee was mentioning. Uh, so there are a few unique aspects here that's gonna be really helpful for us. Uh, Veriset's going to give us the raw population movement data. So it's gonna be the phone level location and time that we can use to uh, essentially create our own foot traffic measure. Most of these companies will give you an endpoint. They'll say, you, know, you get uh, how many people want to target on this date. Uh, with this data, we're actually going to be able to create that own measure for ourselves to these brokerage offices. Um, so we get that raw data, but we still get a, a big sample. It's about 50 million phones from 2019 to today. Um, and that raw processing is a big part of why we're in this proposal stage and not the, the full paper stage. We're about 400 terabytes and growing of this raw data. So a lot of data to crunch um, that we're hoping to use the feedback from today to, to create a, uh, an, an interesting study. So just big picture how this works for those of you who aren't familiar with this type of data. Uh, what will happen is, so I've got four people over here and they're all using their phones throughout the day. Um, so if you're using, for example, a uh, weather app to see what it's like that day or traffic on the way to the office, or maybe you're just browsing social media. Uh, if these apps partner with Veriset, they're gonna send pings periodically to Veriset, either when the app is running while you're looking at it, or if it's just left on in the background. Uh, so as they move throughout the day, we're going to capture when they are within this office. So any office building that we have the address for, we can match them there. And then another nice thing about the Veriset data is we're going to be able to see what time they go and what location they're at using the lap and lawn. Uh, but we're also commonly get it given the altitude of the phone. So here we've got you know, Mr. Orange and Mr. Blue at the same building but maybe JP Morgan's on the second floor, Stiefel is on the seventh. Uh, we're gonna be able to use the most commonly reported altitude of these phones to say, you know, Mr. Origin, Mr. Orange is probably at JP Morgan because he's most likely on the second floor, whereas Mr. Blue is at Stiefel because he's on the seventh floor, which is really important for this setting because a lot of these analysts are working in high rises in Manhattan or downtown Chicago. Uh, so it'll really help us isolate you know, exactly which brokerage office we're looking at. So we have some of this data collected and we're processing it. So we have uh, the San Francisco MSA, 
uh, the brokerage offices there. So there's about 50 branches in that area. Um, and here I'm showing you the relative foot traffic to these offices. So every single line here is a different brokerage branch that I'm gonna highlight two specific ones. Uh, so I'm showing relative foot traffic. This is relative to the first two months of 2020 um, and then a seven day moving average. Uh, so as you'd expect, we see a drastic decline during the lockdowns. Um, and then it stays rather low throughout the, the post period for the, you know, the first half of 2020. But if we kind of zoom in on all of that post lockdown period, you can tell that there's a lot of variation between these branches. So for example, Stiefel is a big proponent of work from home according to our data. So they dropped about 90% lower than uh, pre-pandemic and have stayed really steady at that level. Morgan Stanley, however, has a similar drop at the beginning, but has kind of trickled back into the office more so. So they're uh, still much lower than pre-pandemic, but about 63% lower. So these are firms in the same MSA. So they're exposed to the same lockdown orders, the same you know, broad COVID health uh, exposures. And yet we still see variation there. So there's gonna be a lot of sources of this variation we can exploit to think about, you know, did a Morgan Stanley analysts uh, produce a better forecast than a Stiefel Nicholas um, analyst. The way we're going to measure this is essentially uh, that work from office measure I was showing you in reverse. So how many people are working from the office in uh, a branch during a specific quarter during the uh, 2020 and beyond relative to our pre-period? And then we'll just take one minus that to create the work from home measure. So we're not going to be able to do this uh, specifically for each analyst because our data agreement doesn't allow us to actually identify a phone as a specific person. Uh, so any brokerage branch that an analyst works for, they're going to all have that same work from home measure, but it'll still be at the analyst quarter level. Um, we'll be able to do this either with the, the number of hours worked by those analysts or the average unique visits that they make um, in a quarter. And we want to look at this for analyst research quality first. Uh, so we're going to think about things like their forecast accuracy, the pessimism uh, frequency, um, and things like that. Uh, and just a standard regression framework uh, where we'll have work from home as our variable of interest on the right side. We'll be able to have a lot of controls for analyst level things as well as local COVID cases and deaths. Um, and then we can use a lot of different fixed effects ties. So We'll be able to use analyst, brokerage office, um, brokerage house level. So maybe JP Morgan's New York office is more active than its San Francisco office. We can look at that variation. And then we'll be able to subsume a lot of firm effects by using firm by time fixed effects. Uh, and we, we plan to use the pre-period of about 2015 to today and just assume that there wasn't work from home being uh, conducted prior to 2020 and then just use that variation in 2020. Uh, as the main driver of our results. There likely is going to be a lot of different reactions to uh, work from home as we, we've kind of talked about already today. So we'll, we'll look at this in um, kind of interaction effects where we'll say maybe more experienced analysts are better able to adapt to work from home. Um, or if, you know, if you're working on a much more harder to value firm, maybe it's, it's harder when you're at home. Um, and there also might be gender effects as we'll see later on today, uh, really to just try to isolate who is work from home good for and who might have, may be hurting. Uh, then we we're gonna switch this over to more of the firm side, so the brokerage side on um, whether or not work from home helps them attract or retain really good employees. Um, so there's certain evidence that the employees like this. So we wanna see if they're able to keep their good employees based on the work from home measure. And the way we're going to do this is just use a, a retain indicator. So if an analyst continues to work for the firm in future quarters, uh, relative to our work from home measure and uh, an interaction with a high quality analyst. So of course we want to keep our high quality employees, which we will measure based on things like their past accuracy, their stock recommendation, et cetera. Um, so we can look at this for whether or not they're retaining employees and as well as hiring new employees, just using a sample of new analysts that come into the data set. Are they able to also hire better employees based on their work from home policy? 
Uh, so the last thing we'll want to look at is financial market consequences. So if there is variation in um, how work from home affects research quality, we'll likely see this aggregate up to the firm level. So an average work from home measure for you know, all analysts covering a firm, does that increase or decrease the firm informational environment? And again, there's, there's competing effects here. So it's really going to need to be taken to the data to find out whether work from home either you know, increases or decreases the bid ask spreads of firms, the other liquidity or earning surprise measures. Um, so being able to take this from the, the analyst through the firm and then to, to the stock level is kind of uh, why we think our, our work from home measure will be unique um, in, in answering some questions uh, that are still open um, in finance right now. So I just want to mention one thing that we're, we're, we're broadly thinking about with this paper going forward. Uh, COVID setting is nice here because we have more of this exogenous shock of why people had to go work from home and yet we'll still see variation based on these different geographies. Going forward, work from home is going to be more of a choice. So we've seen this in anecdotes as well. Goldman is a, a leader in bringing people back to the office, whereas other financial workplaces are seeing varying paces of occupancy growth. Um, so we're going to have this setting where we can hopefully identify this tightly, but then we have to think more about how is this going to, to play out going forward, where it's more of a choice by these types of firms. So hopefully there'll be a lot of generalizable implications from that. So that's our proposal. So we think work from home is going to be a really important impact on workplace dynamics going forward. And we think smartphone data is going to be a really good way to measure uh, the propensity to work from home. It's going to allow us to think about things like analyst research quality, um, employer retention for these brokerage houses, and then finally financial market outcomes. And then again, hopefully our settings really going to allow us to look at this tight identifications uh, piece because these analysts are all looking at the same uh, outcome variables and we have this shock to, to use um, while also still leading to generalizable takeaways going forward. Um, but that's our proposal. I really appreciate the, the opportunity and I look forward to comments and questions. Great. Thank you, Mark. You are perfectly on time. Uh, before we go to our next presenter, I would like to take this opportunity and say that a uh, general audience can ask questions through the Q&A box. And if there is time at the end, uh, presenters will have a chance to, to reply to these questions. And it's also opportunity for the presenters or their co-authors who are online to look at these questions and, and potentially answer them uh, in between. Uh, let's move to our Second paper, this paper will be presented by Meng Chao Du. I hope I pronounce your name correctly, if not. Exactly correct. <laughs> happy to hear that. Uh, Meng Chao is from University of Mannheim and she will talk about female analysts attention during work from home. Meng Chao, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, welcome to my presentation. My name is Meng Chao Du. I'm from University of Mannheim in Germany. I will be on the job market this fall. Today, I'm going to present my paper, Locked in at Home, Limited Attention of Female Analysts During the COVID-19 Pandemic. After the COVID-19 pandemic, we started to work from home. And I realized that it is a COVID-19 pandemic and also the measures such as school closures are an extraordinary shock to domestic duties. Therefore, I use this extraordinary shock to study how domestic responsibilities influence professional women. Even though in the past decades, an increasing number of women participated in the labor market, women are still underrepresented in competitive industries. For example, among female analysts in the US, only around 10% are female, and the gender pay gap amounts to even 20,000 per year. What could be, the, could be the reason that prevents professional women from being equally successful in competitive industries? There are many reasons why there is a gender gap. Among them, uh, back in 1995, used sexual division of labor theory to explain the gender gap in the labor market. In this theory, it is optimal for a household to specify who does what, who does the specify in market work and who specify in uh, domestic work. Women are usually the ones spend more time and efforts on domestic activities. 
and when women participate in the labor market, these professional women have less time and limited attention for market work because they are distracted by domestic work. In the financial analyst literature, it is well established that limited attention leads to less timely forecasts, and less timely forecasts have unfavorable career outcomes. Putting together, it is possible that professional women are distracted by domestic activities, and therefore they are in a less favorable position in competitive industries. What happened after the COVID-19 pandemic? We see that women are more vulnerable to COVID-19 related economic effects. As uh, seen from the media coverage, women published less during the pandemic. And Rini also mentioned that at the very beginning in our, pre in our workshop. And also um, McKenzie report showed that women are more likely to lose their job and earn less after the COVID-19 pandemic. So taking this interesting perspectives together, I take advantage of a quasi natural experiment in which schools are extraordinarily closed by states during the COVID-19 pandemic to study whether female analysts are more likely to be influenced by domestic responsibilities. I found that female analysts are less likely to issue timely forecasts after the COVID-19 school closures. With manually collected data, I use triple difference estimation to show that mothers are 20% less likely to issue timely forecasts after school closures. So this quantifies the negative effect of COVID-19 school closures on professional women. Female analysts uh, also shift the time of the day when they work. They shift the forecast release time to hours without intensive housework. However, I do not find significant and robust evidence that COVID-19 school closures also influence forecast accuracy. The contribution to the literature. The paper is the first to link domestic distractions to financial market. In the limited attention literature, uh, studies have shown that Contemporaneous earnings announcements or, for example, spot events leads to limited attention in the financial market and influence financial decision making. In this paper, I show a causal effect of domestic distractions on limited attention in the financial market. Secondly, there are many studies examining the reasons for the gender gap in the labor market. This paper provides empirical evidence for the sexual division of labor theory in DACA 1985. Uh, finally, the paper also contributes to our understanding of the social impact of COVID-19. This paper quantifies the negative effect of the COVID-19 school closures on professional matters. It should be noted that lockdown measures may unequally influence different groups. Next, move on to the empirical part. The main data comes from the IBES database and cover earning announcement events and individual analyst forecasts. School closure data are collected from media coverage or official documents online. I also need to manually collect analyst identity, gender, and location because IBES database does not provide the identity of analyst. Firm level control variables are obtained from CRSP and Compute Start. The sample. Uh, I used the earning forecasts after earning announcements of the first two quarters in 2020. In this way, I have a semi symmetric window around the school closure events. Uh, yeah, and to study the timely response of analysts, I used the first forecast by each analyst for. From uh, uh, firm's next quarter uh, for earnings forecast after the firm's current quarter earnings announcement. Following previous literature, I also did some screenings on the sample. Uh, these are quite standard, so I will just omit in this presentation for the sake of time. So the main dependent variable 
the forecast timeliness of analyst forecasts is measured by a dummy variable equal to one if the analyst issues an earnings forecast for the next quarter within one trading day after the firm's current quarter earnings announcement date. In this figure, I plot the probability to issue timely forecast in a four week window around the school closing events. So as we can see, for both male and female analysts, there is a reduction in forecast timeliness after the COVID-19 school closures. However, the effect it was larger and lasted longer for female analysts. The identification strategy mainly relies on this uh, exogenously closed schools after the COVID-19 pandemic. So as we can see in the map, there was some uh, variations across states. California, Kentucky, New York, and New Jersey are among those who, uh, who are first announced a requirement or recommendation of school closures. Later on, the other states also followed. Until the end of March, uh, basically all states announced a state level school closure measure. I run a different DIF estimation and use the regression I regress a timely dummy, the, for the measure for forecast the timeliness on an interaction term between the female dummy and school closure dummy, controlling for various control variables and fixed effects. Standard arrows are clustered by analyst and firm. In this summary statistic table, we can see that only 10% 10, 10 of the analysts are female. 74% uh, of the forecasts are timely. This is consistent with the previous literature, especially in recent years. Uh, analysts respond really fast after the earnings announcements. Most of them are able to uh, issue earnings forecast within one trading day. Uh, this table presents the main result. No matter what fixed effects I use, the coefficient estimate of the interaction term between female dummy and school closure dummy are negative and statistically significant. It amounts to around 10% of the baseline average for recast timeliness. Having firm times quarter fix effect, we are comparing forecasts after the same firm's same earning announcements, so in the same quarter. And our controlling for analyst fix effect takes out, like for example, analyst habit. Uh, and therefore, uh, I indeed ca uh, try to capture what is happening after the school closures of COVID-19 pandemic. The comparison of forecast timeliness in the whole sample pooling analysts with and without children may underestimate the treatment effect because child wearing duties are critical for the effect. I collect data on family conditions of analysts by checking their Facebook pages. Uh, in the end, I'm able to identify 262 analysts as having at least one non-adult child. Uh, and the other analysts, I put them in the control group. This setting allows me to conduct a triple difference, or say difference in difference in differences analysis, which uses higher order construct to draw causal inference. Uh, first, I plot the change in the percentage of timely forecasts for four groups of analysts. Uh, first, I divide the analysts based on their gender, and secondly, based on whether I can identify them as having children. As we can see, there is a negative effect of school closures for all analysts, but the effect is as high as 14 percentage points for female with children. And for male analysts with children, the effect is not even statistically significantly differ from zero. Uh, among other analysts, there is a significant negative effect because, of course, Facebook data is not a perfect way to identify whether analysts have children or not. This analyst in the control group can be still influenced by school closures or lockdown measures, so there is a negative effect in uh, forecast timeliness, but there is no gender effect. 
Uh, this table presents the results of the triple difference analysis. The triple interaction term has a negative and statistically significant effect. So uh, this estimation quantifies the negative effect of forecast timeliness on mothers uh, on, on mother on mothers forecast timeliness and the economic magnitude amounts to around 20 percent of the average forecast timeliness in the sample so uh, to summarize this uh, triple difference estimation tells us indeed domestic duties influence uh, mother analysts and the effect is economically large for the analysts who are not that likely to have children, there is no gender difference. Therefore, the findings I have uh, are not likely to be due to, for example, gender difference in risk aversion or different responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to forecast timeliness, I also uh, found that uh, female analysts shift the time of uh, the day they work. I use the forecast issue time from IBES database and convert it to local time. So as we can see in this some statistic, uh, summary statistic like table, uh, we I see that uh, we can see that there is much change, much change for female analysts. Okay, thank you. I have two minutes. Uh, so uh, the, in the regression, I show that female analysts are less likely to issue timely forecast during house uh, work intensive time. In the end, I also examine other forecast qualities, for example, the forecast bonus and the accuracy. However, how school closures influence this, uh, these measures are not that clear as uh, forecast the timeliness. Previous literature has shown that limited attention influences forecast the timeliness only because uh, analysts can delay their forecast to make them more accurate. And also for the measure of forecast boldness, we usually compare the forecast with the consensus. But when analysts are distracted, they may not even have time to pay attention to the forecasts of their peers. Therefore, the hypothesis here is not as clear as uh, what we have for forecast timeliness. Nevertheless, I run similar different diff analysis here and do not find robust and significant evidence that COVID-19 school closures have a effect on of forecastableness or accuracy of female analysts. So to conclude, the paper found strong and robust evidence that COVID-19 school closures negatively influenced the forecast timeliness of female analysts. I don't have time to show further cross-sectional effects here, but it is interesting to find that this effect is larger in states where the general gender attitude are conservative. In states, women are more likely to work more on domestic work. Uh, conducting a triple difference analysis with manually collected data, I estimate the negative effect on professional mothers. So it is important to note that even women in a competitive profession, uh, they are more vulnerable to COVID-19 related social effects and they are taking more domestic work. From the bright side, if we can get more support from the society or there is a more equal allocation of work between gender at home, the gender gap may be able to be mitigated. So thank you very much for your attention and I appreciate the opportunity to present my paper here. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to your comments. Now we will move to the third paper. Uh, the third paper will be presented by Dennis Sosura from Arizona State. And Dennis will talk about the economics of long distance CEOs. Dennis, you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much for having me. Um, this is Joan Walk with Ron Duchin at Boston College, who's here with us in the audience. Um, to motivate this paper, uh, I would like to point out that just like there's a growing trend towards 
remote work in the general labor force, there's definitely a growing trend towards remote management more broadly in corporate governance. So more and more CEOs are opting to work remotely from different locations. And the 2020 pandemic was a significant catalyst that will likely lead to the, um, lead to the uh, continuation of this trend. So for example, in the 2020 um, Gartner survey of top executives states that um, nearly three quarters of executives plan to increase their remote work after the pandemic is over. And 90% of these executives expect minimal disruptions while working offsite. So given that there seems to, to be a trend towards greater remote management, that trend is likely to stay or accelerate. The question we'll ask in this paper is how effective is remote management during normal business times? So when we get back to the kind of business as usual, um, the goal is to see how effective such arrangements are. And here, there are a couple of divergent views in remote management. On the one hand, uh, we have efficiency gains. So um, survey evidence indicates that CEOs spend about three quarters of their time in meetings. And we know that meetings could probably be done more efficiently on Zoom and remotely. And another 11% of, of their time CEOs spent in uh, electronic communication, again, which can be done effectively offsite. Organization design literature points out to numerous benefits of uh, this hands-off or remote management style. And some of the CEOs are strong supporters of this hands-off management style from a distance. So he here I'd like to give you a quote from the founder and CEO of Patagonia who says that I'm a strong advocate of an MBA management style where MBA stands for managing by absence. Okay. On the other side, uh, we have the possibility of agency frictions you know, they, that may result from absenteeism, consumption of leisure, information loss that may be um, related to remote uh, working arrangements. And here I'd like to point out a recent example um, of an activist campaign that was launched by Paul Singer, uh, an activist investor of Elliott Asset Management, with the goal to oust the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, um, for, who was working remotely from overseas uh, very often. And you know, before the campaign, he was contemplating uh, moving permanently to Africa and managing Twitter and Square from from uh, from overseas from Africa. Okay. So in here, you could see how investors reacted to such a campaign. So when the campaign was announced, so the, poss mere, the mere possibility of removing um, the uh, a long distance CEO had a, an 8% uh, daily announcement returns. Okay. So at, at, at these two tensions give us um, the, um, the uh, motivate the paper and give us the main hypothesis of looking at the relationship between um, CEO long distance arrangements and firm performance. So how do we identify such arrangements? We rely pretty much solely on firms' official disclosures to make sure we accurately identify these uh, uh, remote that these remote relationships. So uh, the first source is CEO contracts. Um, well, here um, there are a couple of examples where they disclose explicitly uh, in the employment agreement that the CEO is allowed to work remotely. So for example, executive shall not be required to relocate his principal residence from Los Angeles to Englewood, Colorado, or executives in connection with the executive's commute from his residence in New York, the company will reimburse him the cost of weekly trips from New York to San Diego. Okay. Uh, another, uh, another place where the companies disclose these arrangements is in proxy statements, where they oftentimes disclose relocation expenses or um, any um, additional commuting and housing expenses associated with remote working arrangements. So for example, because Mr. Bidzis, the CEO of VeriSign, was located in California and the company headquarters are in Virginia, the company provided Mr. Bidzis with a corporate lease apartment and an automobile while he was in Virginia. And another example, the company pays for Mr. Mitchell, the CEO, to travel to our headquarters in Minneapolis from his office in San Diego. Uh, finally, because we, we would like to really exploit the variation in remote working arrangements within the same CEO and within the same firm to try to um, control for all the omitted variables um, and, and firm level characteristics, we'd like to um, look at the start and end uh, of these remote arrangements again within the same CEO firm pairs. So to find the start and end dates of remote arrangements, we'll look at the amendment dates, um, or to amendments to employment agreements where we get the effective dates. Um, and we get to look at the disclosure of relocation expenses and proxy statements. Once the executive relocates, we know that the um, long distance arrangement has, has ended. Um, when, when we identify the, the executive primary residence, we always look for the, we, we, and we're pretty much always able to find the exact address where the CEO uh, resides permanently 
and we consider the CEO's primary residence to be the residence where he lives with his spouse and where he's registered to vote. So main findings. First, um, these remote working arrangements at the executive level are increasingly common and economically important. Uh, we estimate that over 10% of publicly traded companies have had a long distance CEO in recent history since 2000. Uh, these, these companies are across all the main industries and they across almost all the states. And these remote working relationships are indeed indeed long distance. So for example, the, the average distance between the CEO's home and headquarters is over a thousand miles. So they're definitely far, far away. Um, in the performance results, we when we distinguish between the efficiency um, hypothesis and the frictions hypothesis, we find evidence consistent with a frictions or an agency story. So when we look at the, uh, the same firm and the same CEO, we find that the same CEO delivers about 1.6 percentage points lower ROA uh, and about 10 percentage points lower to Minsky when he's in a remote working arrangement at the same firm. So these are economically important results and economically important consequences. And again, they will uh, control for you know, sort of the endogenous matching of CEOs and the firms and the, as well as the unobservable characteristics of the firm and the CEO that remain constant within a short time frame around these arrangements. Um, in, when we look at the variation in these performance differentials, we find that they expand when there's a greater distance between the CEO's residence and the headquarters, and there's a greater time difference, suggesting that sort of, a, a, for example, a time difference may um, reduce the, the feasibility or the efficiency of these remote uh, arrangements. Um, when the CEOs, when CEOs, when these remote um, CEOs are terminated, investors really cheer um, such outcomes and the departures of remote CEOs are associated with positive announce announcement returns to the tune of uh, two percentage points. Very similar um, to the reaction that I showed you in the motivating slides with the um, campaign to remove Jack Dorsey. Um, and finally, economic channels, some preliminary evidence. We find uh, um, some evidence of short-termism, so lower investment uh, in R&D, kind of long-term expenditures that are going to pay off in the future, and lower uh, investment in long-term assets when we look at the assets useful life. So this is suggestive of uh, maybe the CEOs in these remote working arrangements understanding that they're probably not going to be there for the, for the long term. Okay. And we also find evidence of increased consumption of leisure, such as purchases of beach homes, uh, purchase of boats, and uh, increased consumption of perquisites. So overall, um, our evidence is that remote working arrangements appear to shift incentives and productivity of CEOs, and um, these shifts do not appear to be value or performance improving um, in our findings. So that's the paper in a nutshell. Now let me go ahead and, and give you a little bit of a flavor of the economics of long distance CEOs, of how these relationships arise and how we identify their effects. So here I'm showing you the map of, um, of, of the United States where the darker colors represent states with a higher fraction of long distance CEOs. Um, so this is the, the fraction of CEOs that have remote working arrangements relative to all CEOs or all firms in that state. And you see that the CEOs prefer to have a long distance arrangement or maybe get away from the headquarters of the firm where when the headquarters of the firm is in inland rural or cold, cold, uh, rural states or in colder climates. So some of the frequent uh, states are Wyoming, Vermont, Kansas that are sort of in the middle of the country, colder climates far away from the coast. Okay. So where do they go? Where do um, these um, long distance CEOs actually live? So first, um, many of them go to the beach. About 36% of long distance CEOs literally live on the beach. Their primary residence is within one point, you know, is within point one miles of the coastline. So you could see that there's big clusters here in uh, Florida, Georgia, along the coastline, as well as the northeastern coastline. Second, relative to headquarters, they tend to move to warmer and milder climates. So you see that they're moving generally from states like Nebraska, Kansas, South Dakota, North Dakota, over to the coasts and, and further to the south. You see there are no commuters who chose to live in, in North Dakota, for example, uh, or, or, or in, in Nebraska or in Louisiana uh, in our sample. And lastly, they tend to gravitate towards states with lower taxes. So both pecuniary and non-pecuniary incentives seem to matter. So let me show you a few interesting patterns here. When you look at the borders of the two states uh, where they could have chosen to live either on, on either side of the border, presumably. If you look, for example, at Washington moving from left to the right, Washington in the upper right corner of the state 
has zero um, capital gains and income taxes. And most of the CEOs sort of prefer to live on the on the side of the Washington border in the state of Washington rather than the state of Oregon, which has high taxes. The same with Nevada and California. So you could see that executives opting up uh, to live in Nevada. Tennessee, again, no state income tax to, uh, and then those on the border opting to live in, in uh, lower tax residences. So as you can imagine, overall, both pre pecuniary and non-pecuniary incentives matter for the location of loan distance CEOs, and they tend to optimize both on lifestyle and, and taxes, it appears. Okay, now um, the main results on performance. Um, so here, this is the perhaps the main chart in the paper that shows in event time, the effect of loan distance arrangements on uh, firm performance. So here on the uh, y-axis, we have uh, return on assets at the firm. And on the x-axis, uh, on the x-axis, we have the event time in years relative to the beginning of the working arrangement. So we find a, a big and persistent drop in the um, ROA when a, C, when a firm CEO begins working remotely. And such a drop is persistent and shows no reversal in, in the next few years. Okay, so that's a graphical illustration. Let me, let me show you a similar result in regression evidence where we can control for fixed effects and other uh, unobservables. So here again, uh, if you look at uh, years before the start of the long distance arrangement, there's no significant pretrend um, and in performance. So the, there's no indication that these uh, working arrangements start after some changes in performance, but there's a significant and uh, persistent effect uh, when these long distance arrangements begin, there's a significant drop in ROA that appears to be persistent and gets, significant, uh, gets statistically stronger as we move further into the remote arrangement period. Uh, we use a variation of fixed effects and perhaps the most restrictive specification here is with firm times CO, high dimensional fixed effects, which will control both for the unobservable characteristics of the firm and the CO, as well as the matching of the CO firm pairs. So these results uh, appear to be um, robust to, again, controlling for unobservables of the CO uh, and the firm as well as, as, well as the, their batch. Okay. And lastly, to, to get us closer to, to a causal statement, we'll offer uh, evidence from an instrumental variable. So we need an instrument for the decision of the CEO to work remotely as opposed to move to the company's headquarters. Um, and such a decision that is plausibly unrelated to firm outcomes, we propose the difference in high school quality be be between the prior residence of the CEO and the county of the headquarters. Um, so the argument here and the relevance condition is that CEOs who have high school kids are more likely to work long distance if moving to the location of the company's headquarters would put their um, kids at a disadvantage of moving them to a weaker school. So let's say if the CEO lives in Boston uh, with, high, with high quality schools, they may be less likely to move to Kansas or, or Arizona, maybe where the, the high school quality is, is lower. Okay. We find this to be really the case uh, with F statistic over uh, 12, and um, it is also in line with a lot of disclosures made by the firms themselves. So here's an example from um, Jamie Diamond, he, uh, and uh, again from JP Morgan proxy statement. It says that Mr. Diamond and his family resided in Chicago and planned to keep Chicago as their home while their children completed high school. So. Uh, that being the reason for the commute. Then uh, J.C. Penney, Mr. Johnson, Ron Johnson has uh, school-aged children and he and his wife decided um, they, they, it did not make sense for them to uproot their family. Again, this is from the public statement of J.C. Penney. So we find that uh, uh, in the first stage, uh, be, this is a strong predictor, the difference in high school quality is a strong predictor of uh, uh, long distance arrangements with F statistic of 12.5 and, and three, T statistics over three. Um, and in the second stage, we, when we um, use predicted values of long distance CEO arrangements, we find that they, um, are, that they lead to weaker firm performance and lower valuation. So if you buy the instrument, this would mean that such arrangements tend to reduce or uh, firm outcomes, weaken firm outcomes. So that's the paper. Let me go ahead and conclude. We find that CEO's working arrangements are associated with weaker performance and lower valuation. Such arrangements don't appear to last. Um, um, the 10 years of uh, long distance CEOs are usually terminated early and investors cheer such terminations with high announcement return. So overall, I'll provide novel evidence on the efficacy of CEOs uh, remote arrangements. Thank you for your time. Right, thank you, Dennis. You are precisely on time. And now we will move to the general discussion, which will be by Margarita Sosora from Cornell University. Uh, 
Margarita, you have 15 minutes again. Thanks so much for, uh, to the organizers for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure reading all the papers and I learned a lot. Uh, so, yes, great. So the US economy is now a working from home economy. Uh, before COVID, uh, less than 10% of US workers were uh, full-time working at home. But if you see the survey by Barrero, Bloom and Davis, uh, in uh, 2020, when they ask employees in their survey, they have about 5,000 employees. They ask every, uh, every month, people that earn at least $20,000, when they ask them, what is your current work status? About 42% of them say, we are working from home, okay? And working from home accounts for more than two thirds of the economic activity. And this uh, kind of trend uh, towards working from home is unlikely to fully revert after the COVID crisis. Um, and th there is this recent, and I think also Mark mentioned that, this recent survey uh, by PricewaterhouseCoopers find that more than 50% of workers are interested to work from home at least two to three days per week, even after COVID. So it means that working from home is something that is here to stay, and we need to understand better the effects it has on firms and employees. Um, so there are two main issues that it's interesting to investigate. Uh, is, it, is working from home a management practice that can raise productivity and at the end of the day profitability for firms? And also, um, how can affect the work and life balance? Because nowadays there's a lot of concern about work-life balance. Uh, if you think about the percentage of parents who work full-time, both of them work full-time. Uh, if you see in 1970, it was about 40% of families uh, parents are with fam with uh, children were working both of them. Nowadays, it's uh, more than uh, 62%. That means there are even more concerns about uh, work-life balance. And policymakers also try to address and have measures uh, trying to have policies to improve it. But you know, we have very little evidence on how policies affect it. And potentially working from home could be something that can affect work-life balance uh, for uh, employees with uh, you know, uh, young children. And it's important to understand does uh, working from home uh, affect uh, retention? Does it help uh, with retention? Does it help with job satisfaction and attracting uh, talent? Uh, one of the most cited papers when it comes to working from home uh, comes from the experimental evidence from a Bloom and co-authors, where they use this uh, random uh, experiment they did with the call center employees in Asia, where randomly they chose some of them to work remotely while some, uh, the, the rest stayed, uh, some of them were staying uh, working in the office. What they find, they find that 13% increase in performance over the nine months of the experiment, they actually found that this increase in performance come from uh, employees working longer, uh, uh, longer, like more minutes per shift, uh, because they didn't have to lose time commuting or you know grabbing a coffee or making a tea uh, or talking with uh, other chatting uh, or you know over eating cake. Um, and they also find that they have more calls per minute, so they find increased productivity overall. They also find that it affected attrition rates, uh, and you know a headache for managers is. Uh, having employees quit and, and hiring again uh, and train them and attrition rate fell by 50 percent and there was more work satisfaction overall total factor productivity increased by 20 to 30 percent and uh, the company set about 2000 per year on cost because of the uh, very expensive location of, of the offices per employee that, uh, that uh, works remotely uh, but of course as the authors say is that you know these were uh, low-paid employees with compensation based on performance pay and less creative tasks. And one thing is, you know, what about high skill employees and the papers today focus on high skill employees, which is an important group, because if you think during COVID, uh, the majority of people who uh, ended up working uh, from home were having a four year college degree or a graduate degree. Okay, so understanding the impact on high skill employees is super important. The other thing is, um, it's very different if you think about the experiment happening in normal times versus working from home during COVID, right? When you have a, there's this picture of somebody working from home quietly, they have their own, uh, part of the experiment was they had to have their own dedicated room to perform their work. While, you know, when you think about working from home during COVID, uh, there was 
not optimal home arrangements for working from home. Uh, and of course, we had uh, school closures, which was like a, a very hard for parents to deal with it. Okay. Um, so what are the evidence during COVID? And I'll just put some of the evidence. Of course, there are many, uh, there are uh, other studies as well. And I focus the ones that are based on uh, performance data rather than surveys. Uh, there is this recent paper by Gibson Cawthor that they find a decline in productivity um, during the for high skilled IT professionals in Asia when they were during COVID they had to move uh, to work from home. They actually find that they work more hours, but the output did not change. So then they were trying to understand, okay, why although they work more hours, you know, productivity goes down, and they seen that a big of the loss of the uh, productivity was due to more time spent in meetings and coordination. And I think for all of us that we spend so much time on uh, during having uh, you know, uh, Zoom meetings, we know that kind of meetings take a lot of time. They also find um, that there was bigger effect for women, no matter whether uh, they had kids or not. So it seemed they had more things to do at home, uh, and they find effect more pronounced for parents. But there are the evidence uh, that so increasing productivity, and this comes from uh, Manuel and Hariton that they see call center workers in US. What they find there, it's interesting that this company was giving even pre-COVID choice to be remote or uh, uh, in person, but after COVID, they all moved in uh, remote. What they found, they found that productivity rose when they switched to remote work, but the average productivity was lower for the initial remote workers than in the initial office workers. So their findings show there's this selection that it seems there is adverse selection effect and more productive work is preferred to be in the office. I think that has a lot of implications about how we think about policies moving forward. And uh, it would be also interesting Part to investigate in the papers that we're presenting today. But of course, there are many open questions, right? How, how the effects are different for high versus low skill employees? It seems from these studies that there are different, so we need to understand this more. Uh, how it affects complex tasks, communication, coordination, uh, collaboration. There's this uh, evidence from Kuhn about chess players that they perform worse online. Um, and what is the long-term effect on innovation? So what is the long-term effect for firms and employees that perform complex tasks? Um, especially if you think about after COVID, uh, after COVID uh, and then having a, a choice whether to be uh, working from home or not, a big question is what could be the effect of this choice? We saw some evidence about employee selection. We need to understand what drives this negative selection, right? Is it a shorter uh, career ladder for those that work remotely? Um, and so we need to understand it because it can have implications for future policies. It will make harder for companies to give choice to work remotely if uh, they cannot address this uh, adverse selection uh, effects. Um, and so what is the impact of diversity? Uh, we know women have a bigger, like they're more often to have preference to work from home, but uh, we also know from the paper of Bloom that uh, working remotely uh, is associated with low promotion rates. So what are the implications? This can make actually the existing gaps between men and women in the workplace even bigger. So that's something that uh, I think, you know, future research and the papers today can shed more light on. Okay, so today's paper touched some of these uh, open questions and it was, it was a pleasure uh, reading this paper. For example, uh, starting with the paper of Mark uh, that was looking, working from home evidence from sell-side analysts. So the paper focuses on sell-side analysts which are high skill employees uh, performing challenging cognitive tasks, which is a set of employees we really need to understand more about. Uh, and, they, and this setting allows them to have this detailed data on output, quantity, and quality. And you know, they can even see how they perform for the same company at the same time. This is a very useful variation. Um, and so it, it's, a, uh, they, it's a very nice setting. And as uh, Mark said, they plan to develop a working from home intensity at the brokerage uh, branch level using them smartphone geolocation and timestamp data. Okay. Uh, and their goal and, uh, is to see research quality and cross-sectional patterns, retention and hiring, and as well as how it impacts the information environment of firms covered by this analyst. 
Um, as Mark said, the paper is preliminary. They're waiting for the data to come. I think it's a very promising setting. And you know, the authors have already lined up a very uh, uh, interesting set of questions to investigate. Uh, if I had like kind of by reading the proposal, some uh, kind of um, my two cents is that I think kind of a big part of the paper can be understanding employee selection and employee career pro progression in these companies. Because it is like kind of, if you think about um, analysis are uh, workers in the financial sector, high paying jobs, and uh, you know, how it will affect diversity and hiring women and the progression of women in the workplace can have big impact. Um, so do they see any effect on promotion or career progression for men and women? For, uh, in high working from home versus low working from home environments? Uh, the, can they see any difference in promotion rates? Uh, maybe they can even see, um, you know, do, do, company, do women will have a different kind of uh, promotion ladder in these two environments? And uh, maybe they can have some insights to understand the new hires and if they also see negative selection effects uh, and understand better what can drive it. I think understanding uh, kind of this negative uh, selection effects of remote work, it will be uh, first order. Um, and I think one other advantage they have is by kind of uh, waiting for the data is that they can also focus a bit more on the long-term effects. Um, uh, for working from home and about the post-COVID era, uh, do employees get better over time in remote work, right? They can give us also some insights, given that they're going to have a longer horizon, they can give us about some insights about uh, you know, employees getting better uh, doing this over time. So, um, so overall, great setting. I look forward to, to, to read uh, the first uh, draft. Um, let me move to a uh, mental paper uh, where she wants to see um, you know, women and how they're impacted by school closures and the attention uh, and, and their performance in the workplace. And we know women have been deeply affected by the COVID pandemic. I think men's health paper is kind of hitting a, a very important issue. Uh, and we know that uh, COVID has heightened these large and small inequalities, both at work and home, that uh, women face daily. You know, women were making a lot of progress in the workplace. If you think representation of women in a uh, high level uh, parts of the workforce, uh, they were making a, moving towards the right direction. If you see women uh, being senior vice president and being in the C-suite, went from 23% and 70% in 2000. 15 to 28 and 21 percent yeah, in 2020. So really moving in the right direction. But COVID presents a major setback, especially for women. Uh, this is a survey by McKinsey. And they say, you know, how likely you are to downshift your career, uh, but not leave the workforce after 2020. You see that women are more likely to downshift their career, especially if they have young children. And when you, they ask them how likely you are to leave the workforce, you see that women with young children there's, have 23% of them are thinking to leave the workforce, okay? So that means that COVID can have a really negative impact, take us back many, many years on all this progress that women made in the workplace. Uh, so that's why I think uh, uh, Menkeo's paper uh, is super important in understanding the impact of COVID uh, in career of women is key. Um, she focused on cell site analysis, which, as I said, is a great uh, setting and uses the school closures as a quasi uh, natural experiment. She has done an impressive data collection looking for uh, you know, data from Facebook under, to understand which of them have children and not. Um, if I have, like, I, th I think your paper has very nice and very rich results. And uh, I have a complaint to make is that, you know, her main outcome is uh, forecast timeliness. Um, and, you know, she finds that women are less likely to issue timely forecast, which is one day uh, after earnings announcement. Now, you know, if you think about what is the first order for the career of um, um, analyst is accuracy and price impact are first order. And it doesn't seem that distraction from school closures affect accuracy. So I will try, I will encourage you to understand a bit better, like a bit more, uh, how women change the production function. So how, like, uh, you know, um, they manage not to have any effect on um, accuracy despite the distractions. Uh, and also, if you can say something about career pro progression, although I think she already has a lot of results. Uh, and I uh, don't want to ask her to do much more. Uh, and I think overall, very interesting paper. She seems to be a great shape, and I wish her best of luck for her uh, job market uh, next year. Um, 
So to, uh, moving to the last paper, uh, the economics of long distance CO, um, you know, CEOs are key in the company uh, and we need to understand how CEOs work remotely affects companies and strategic decisions. The first thing that came to my mind when I read the paper is, okay, you know, are CEOs in the office to begin with? Does it matter? And I went back to the papers of uh, Bandiera, Pratt and Sadun. This is a, a, the first paper they have on India that they are tracking uh, what CEOs do with their time. And you know, CEOs have a lot of e-meetings, but it seems that most of their meetings are in person. Uh, they also found the same evidence in, um, in Italy, where they see that more than about 60% of the time of the CEOs are consuming meetings. So that's great, I think, for the paper, because it does show that CEOs do have a lot of physical meetings. So the next question is, you know, do they meet colleagues? Do they meet insiders? And I think the paper by Gantiera has this nice insight that says, yeah, you know, a lot of part of their meetings is with insiders only, uh, or mixed insiders and outsiders. So that was great evidence to see because it's, I say, yes, it's important that CEOs are present, okay? So I think kind of the premise of CEOs being far or being in person, it's important given the evidence we have in other papers that they do spend a lot of their time in meetings, especially with insiders, I mean, their colleagues. So that means, CEO being present matters, okay? So I thought that was great to see when I, you know, um, that indeed it matters for CEOs. Um, and as the paper shows about 10% of the firms in, uh, in their sample had a long distance CEO. Um, I think Dennis did an excellent job describing their findings. Uh, they find that uh, firms run by long distance CEO have lower RA and these CEOs have shorter tenure and they get lower returns when they're selling the company. I think one of the, the challenges in the paper, and I think the, the authors try to do their best, is you know, what about selection concerns? It's not random which CEOs are remotely or when the CEOs, what time in their career decide to, to work uh, remotely. Uh, the, the paper makes a lot of effort to address it. Um, they exploit within CEO firm variation. So the same CEO working on the same company, changing the work status. Um, and also they offer an instrument for a uh, long distance CEO's decision using the different in school quality. Uh, if I have some quibbles about identification is, you know, I would like to understand more the variation you have in within firm CEO pairs. I understand these are early, uh, like the drafts are all in progress. Uh, I would like to have more details about how many CEOs change their work arrangement by year. I mean, how exactly like your, this variation you have within firm CEO, you know, um, is driven by how many CEOs, what they do. Uh, also, uh, over what area is the school quality is estimated? I wanted to see, you know, a bit more details of how you construct your instrument. I, I think overall strengthening this part of the paper as much as possible will be kind of uh, greatly benefiting the paper. Um, kind of a concern I had is when you see that, uh, as um, Dennis um, pointed out, if you see that where they live, you know, they live in the coast a lot. Uh, if you see where the long distance CEOs where they're more likely to be headquartered, uh, they're more likely to be headquartered in states like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Wyoming. And what I had in mind is that there might be very specific industries that are located in this, uh, uh, these uh, areas. What you might be picking is uh, picking something that has to be uh, time, uh, you know, time trends, specific industries. I think that's very easy for you to address. Like I would kind of have industry, um, you know, year fixed effects, trying to address differential uh, um, trends in these industries. But I think that's something uh, the authors can uh, easily address. I think just having more, you know, strengthening that part of identification will even, you know, make this paper even stronger. Um, so overall, uh, you know, all the papers, um, go after topical questions. The authors bring new insight, they have a very impressive data collections. Um, we know that uh, working from home is here to stay. It was 5% in the pre-COVID, it's about 60% during COVID. And the surveys suggest that working from home will be about 20% of the workforce post-COVID. So that means it will have a big impact of how comp uh, employees work and big impact of firms. And we need to further understand it. Um, thanks so much and good luck for all the papers. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, we have about 
15 minutes for the presenters to respond uh, to the discussion. And there is also a few questions and comments in the Q&A box. So I think, uh, Mark, you, if you want to respond. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much, Margarita. That's really helpful. I like, especially now with the proposal that the guidance is helpful. We were thinking that the, the employee progression was gonna be an interesting aspect to tie it more to even uh, labor economics. So it's it's good to see that that part's going to be important. And I, I agree that the cross section of analyst characteristics, I think is going to be where a lot of interesting dynamics happen. We've seen a lot of things about how this is going to be an unequal change for a lot of people. So really highlighting that's going to be um, important, I think. Um, and then there was one comment in the, the Q&A about whether analysts may or may not be likely to herd during this period since the uh, the cost of gathering private versus public information may change. I think that's that's a really interesting idea, and I th think we're, we're definitely going to try that. Um, my my prior would be that herding will probably likely um, increase for younger employees who don't have you know contacts at the firms they cover as well, or be able to talk to to try to gather more unique or private information, so they may herd more, whereas more experienced analysts might have. Uh, a better network to draw from to, to still issue maybe more bold forecasts. But yeah, thank you again on, on those great comments. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Vitas, would you like to ask your question? If so, please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I, think, uh, I think Mark already alluded to my question regarding herding behavior post COVID. Uh, and uh, the main issue again is uh, how much weight you put on public versus private information. And two things uh, increase the cost of private information. One is the difficulty of making forecast uh, during COVID when essentially it's a huge macro event. Uh, and the second thing is uh, you don't have the ability to collect private information as easily sitting at home. So I, I think uh, Mark did allude to uh, this, this issue. And I just wanted to know if uh, looking at herding behavior would be interesting uh, in the in the COVID intervention. Thank you. And I think as as we collect more data, we might be able to separate the the, the big macro effect with the work from home effect. As um, you know, we get further away from that shock, we'll have um, still hopefully variation in work from home that we can just think about that private versus public um, information gathering. Then let's move to Mangchao. Uh, I think uh, you have a chance to respond, and I think Miriam had a question which she can ask in person. Uh, thank you very much, Margarita, for your helpful comments. I totally agree that it would be nice to show the long-term career effects. So, but as we all know, it's only like one year now. I hope when data become available, I can show the impact on females' career later on, which would uh, just uh, just uh, just answer my question in the motivation then. Uh, and also about the effect on forecast accuracy, uh, as I, in the table I show, there is a negative effect, but uh, the results are not robust. Uh, it is not statistically significant. So I'm trying to, to do some cross-sectional uh, variation tests to see whether this effect is larger on forecast accuracy of some of the analysts. Uh, so, of course, some people may play it strategically by delaying the forecast. All uh, accuracy is more about their cap capability to interpret information or, uh, or because they have information advantage. Uh, these are less likely to be influenced by this kind of uh, short-term distractions. Uh, but indeed, I will also examine further on that issue. So overall, I think not I have, I do not want to over state my, the contribution. Uh, now what I have is that timeliness may influence the career of the female analysts because it is established that timeliness influences analysts' career. Uh, it may also influence the information supply in the financial market. But again, I do not want to overstate it because uh, only 10% X uh, post a uh, female in the uh, financial analyst industry. Uh, their delay may influence the financial market to a certain extent. 
Um, I see another very interesting discussion in the Q&A that there may be domestic help among analysts. I agree, especially for analysts who usually earn a, a high salary, they are very likely to hire some help at home. And so that is the good thing about COVID-19 school closures. I, I, I did something, I tried to do some uh, something on the, uh, like to measure domestic um, work, I try to use school holidays and stuff like that. However, it is expected and uh, people can hear help, do arrangement, uh, but for COVID-19 school closures, for, even for those who have may, may be able to hear help, uh, their life could have been influenced somehow. And also, I also uh, agree that the effect for professional female analysts should be smaller compared to the general population. But surprisingly, I still found some significant results here. So it seems that even for this, uh, like a very competitive, very competent female, uh, they still need to take more domestic work and have to be distracted from work. So I think that's all my response. I see other interesting uh, questions in the, uh, question in the chat as well, and I, I will respond later. Sorry, I can see that Renee has a hand up and also Miriam, uh, so please go in any order you prefer. Uh, yeah, so I was just thinking because Jesus Sala had a, a comment about uh, what policy uh, proposals we could make. Mm -hmm. um, and so my suggestion, um, sort of thinking about uh, Dennis's uh, presentation about the, the CEO contracts, um, is uh, why don't companies allow um, women or women and men to include the provision of domestic um, helper services in the contracts? Uh, so if they can allow for CEOs to live in different cities as part of the contract, it should be straightforward to also say that the company will pay for um, the women to have uh, domestic workers, right, or help at home. Um, and so that's my policy proposal to corporations uh, that they should be open to contracting over domestic help um, in order to support the very, it seems like the female analysts were actually very high performers. Um, so that seems like a win-win. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have this uh, one kind of uh, big question, uh, big picture question and then a bunch of small mm -hmm. things which I can uh, ask her email later. So the, I, I, listen, I like, first of all, I liked your paper a lot. I thought the presentation was great also, but I'm gonna play the devil here. Um, and, and not that I, I, I buy your story, okay? But I'm still gonna ask, uh, I'm still gonna play the devil. Um, my question is, is it really about gender or is it about having two people who, you know, both are very career driven? You know, most of the men, uh, most of the women, we I think we also see this in our profession. You know, that are let's say finance professor analysts, they're also married to a man who works. But uh, a man who works sometimes has a wife that works and sometimes doesn't help. So you know, it would be interesting to see if what you're um, documenting is just an issue of a dual career parents, or is it really about gender? Um, that's mm -hmm. that's the kind of big picture question. Even mm -hmm. though I still buy your story but I'm mm -hmm. still uh, gonna ask that. Some, some mm -hmm. small things, you know, I, I think from the control group, I would drop uh, observations of people for which you cannot find a Facebook um, page because mm -hmm. we really don't know what their status is. Mm -hmm. um, also, there's a variation and when schools close, there's actually a nice data set, which I was not able to get access to from the Davidson Institute where they actually track it by, by uh, state it's actually a really cool data set but they don't want to share it with me but if you can get something like that that would be really state and date um and also just to explain a little bit more why it's a big problem that the that the women analysts are slow in issuing uh uh their uh forecasts that's it but those are my questions Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for your comments. I also see them in the chart. And uh, about the big picture question, yes, I, I actually didn't intend to make this as a gender story. Uh, I want to use gender as a uh, aggregate measure for the domestic work they take. So, uh, of course, I, I totally agree that uh, what I mean here is uh, those who are distracted by domestic work have less time or energy per unit of time for work. Uh, and that is a source of limited attention in the financial market and also the labor market. 
And I think gender is a good way to, you know, to measure this uh, amount of work taken by people uh, based on a lot of empirical findings. Women usually take more tasks at home. And it, it, I agree that for female analysts, these are very special groups of people. So uh, I also expect the results to be you know, at least weaker compared to the general uh, population. Uh, but surprisingly, they still uh, do, and uh, especially for mothers. Uh, so yeah, I totally agree. And uh, perhaps if uh, ideally I have more information on their family conditions, what their husband or wives do, that would be perfect. But as far as I know, it's not it's not possible. It's very hard to get information like that. But mm -hmm. if data is available, that would be very interesting. Perhaps not only among the citing analysts, even in other um, uh, in other sectors, that would also very interesting to examine. Thanks a lot. So sorry to interrupt you. I would suggest that we move mm -hmm. to Danny so that we stay on time. And if you can take it up for Of course, I can time. also write that. Yeah. 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 So uh, let's go to mm -hmm. Dennis and also Marco uh, had a question. Uh, my approach is for letting you wait. Yeah, well, uh, my question is very simple. I don't understand if uh, there are such inefficiencies from uh, these CEOs, uh, you know, living near the beach rather than close to the office, why companies allow it? So why do they take this, you know, 10% lower uh, profitability rather than, you know, simply uh, kicking them out immediately or actually not hiring them in the first place? Well, Marco, thank you for your question. I think uh, um, a priori it, it's unclear. And I think, uh, um, there's probably a lot of learning on the part of the board as this process unfolds. Uh, the upside is that you, know, you can make an argument that you could hire a star CEO that's outside of your local pool and you know, that it may allow you to attract talent that you wouldn't be able to attract otherwise to accommodate these prospects. And I think CEOs themselves might be learning as well. You, oftentimes you decide you know, I'm going to just commute, but when you do the commute in day in and day out, and I think that happens to us academics as well, um, you realize that that situation is not sustainable. So to me, this, I believe that there is uh, ex ante expectation that this could be a sustainable option, both in the part of the CEO and the board, but then there's learning in the, in the process. And to give you a specific uh, uh, piece of evidence, I think that goes to the learning by the boards. When we look at CEO contracts, we find that once firms have um, have had a commuter CEO, long distance CEO, oftentimes the next time they craft a contract for the incoming CEO, they will include a clause specifically requiring the incoming CEO to relocate to the area near the company's headquarters. Like we've had one, we've learned from it, and now we are requiring you to move. Um, so given that this is a relatively infrequent process, I think that that's that's what's in our view, that's what's happened. 